robots, it seems, will soon be capable of doing anything. Are there any limits to where they can be deployed? What will be left for humans to do when machines can perform the tasks just as well, if not better? And what will happen if and when artificial intelligence becomes superior to our own? This rose is for you. Have a good day. What we are experiencing is a revolution, silently and without resistance. A revolution that was given a name by three experts at an industrial trade fair in Hanover in 2011. Industry 4.0. Originally it was 3.0, but then we did a recount and agreed on 4. Historically speaking, there had already been a third industrial revolution. The way we did it turned out better. The term led to a political debate. Henning Kagemann was CEO of SAP, the largest software company in Europe, before being appointed president of Germany's National Academy of Science and Engineering. Kagerman is considered an influential lobbyist. His partner, the Ministry of Education and Research, is Wolf-Dieter Lukas, who is responsible for everything connected to Industry 4.0. Artificial intelligence expert Wolfgang Walster was also involved in coining the term. We're trying to create computers with, we like to say, ears, hands and feet, and some ability to reason. So the factory of the future is obviously part of that. You are going to witness a demonstration of the world's first automated kitchen. And today... Today we can already build systems that perform certain skills based on pure cognitive intelligence, like driving a car, that work better and with greater precision than humans. The sensory perceptions of humans also have deficits. Take the sense of smell. We can deploy artificial noses as sensors in a food production factory, for example, that have a superior sense of smell to ours. The robot is programmed to cook for up to four people, and that means that it will serve four identical plates. They will look exactly the same and also taste the same. <laughs> Man or machine, people still feel a little perturbed when robots get up close and personal. But the relationship between humans and machines is changing. In the future, robots will be a commonplace, integral part of our lives. That, at least, is the future envisaged by Industry 4.0. At some point the term Industry 4.0 was used to describe a not yet clearly defined approach. What we tried to do was put meat on the bones. For business consultant Thomas Rinn, the term has become the brand of a promotional campaign. What is Industry 4.0? It's the fourth industrial revolution. It means Rin urges his audiences to join the revolution if they don't want to belong to the losers. For us at Roland Berger Strategy Consultants, Industry 4.0 means companies should modernize factories or build new ones, separate the wheat from the chaff. Those who hesitate will eventually be left behind. What does make sense and what is nice The consultant also asks what now needs to be done on the digitalization front. He encourages businesses to upgrade their factories for the future and to train their staff for the new tasks at hand or recruit new staff. The danger, he says, is waiting until they have no choice but to implement Industry 4.0. There's no time to waste. The term industrialization refers to technical and social change. 
In the early and mid 19th century, neighboring towns across Europe joined up to form industrial hubs. The power of steam and water was harnessed to power machines that in turn manufactured consumer goods. Coal and the production of steel and iron in enormous factories were the building blocks of the first industrial revolution. Electricity raised industrial production to a new level. As the number of factories grew, so did gainful employment and the labor market. The second industrial revolution ushered in assembly lines and mass production. The introduction of computers for data processing in the 1980s saw the advent of the third industrial revolution. Now the position of human workers as a production factor was coming under increasing scrutiny. And we are now apparently about to enter a new era, the fourth industrial revolution. Ah, also Terry suchen sie gerade noch, aber kommt scheinbar und Kevin ist die Nummer zwei. Industry 4.0 is gaining traction in Asia. People there are hugely interested in what's happening in Europe and whether Europe has really regained the lead in this area due to the technological upheavals taking place. And our, our CIO, Shang. <laughs> Hi. Nice to meet you. Me Thank you very much. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, welcome to our booth. This delegation represents a Chinese company that could become a major customer for Weidmüller, a German manufacturer of electrical connection technology. This client is one of the biggest manufacturers in the world, with far in excess of a million employees in China. They have a large number of factories, not just in China. When deploying robots on that kind of scale, it's vital that you maximize and realize your potential productivities and efficiencies, and that's our job. It's a simple example. High-rise buildings have elevators, which have to be serviced at regular intervals, let's say every three or six months. And whether they're used once a month or thousands of times, all elevators are subject to that monitoring interval. With Industry 4.0, those 3,000 people who perform that service might become just 100. The elevator or components in the elevator would contact a data analysis center when it needs servicing. It's a completely disruptive concept in terms of technical maintenance. And displacing established factors is what the guests from China are interested in. Their company, Foxconn, currently has 400,000 workers assembling mobile phones in China. Except, the management has announced plans to replace three quarters of them with robots. Every year, the Swiss resort of Davos hosts the World Economic Forum. On the agenda for the first time in January 2016 was automation and the likely prospect of five million jobs disappearing around the globe over the next four years alone. This year's World Economic Forum in Davos centers on a revolution from above, the fourth industrial revolution, or Industry 4.0. Two and a half thousand business leaders, scientists and politicians are discussing the deployment of robots, digitalization and the networking of machines, artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. The founder of the event, Klaus Schwab, calls it possibly the greatest challenge facing the world. Industry 4.0, an industrial revolution. The question is, who will be the winners and who will be the losers of this revolution? This revolution is also being felt in the banking and investment center of Manhattan. In accordance with Microsoft founder Bill Gates' old quote that we need banking but not banks, young companies are providing new solutions via the internet, threatening to replace established financial services providers. An internal survey conducted by the New York office of Deutsche Bank on Wall Street predicts a crisis of unprecedented proportions on the labor market. For the first time, new technical developments are set to destroy more jobs than they create. 
Fewer and fewer workers will be needed for the same output, a change with far-reaching consequences for industry and society. The internal labor market analysis is at odds with upbeat forecasts for Industry 4.0. Is this the reason Deutsche Bank in New York declines to comment? The silhouette of a worker with tool, a work of art in Frankfurt's financial district symbolizing the world of labor. Among the subjects being discussed in the offices towering above the figure, is which jobs will no longer exist in the future. At ING Deber, the German subsidiary of a Dutch financial group, economists Inger Bork and Karsten Boschetsky are working on that very issue. They've been looking into the consequences of digitalization for the German labor market. I've been looking at libraries. Here we have a probability of 97%. That would mean a very large number of professions potentially disappearing. In the case of unskilled or semi-skilled jobs, such as forklift operators or postal workers, we see a probability of 89%. For jobs in inventory, 98%. So that's a lot of jobs gone. Our research shows 59% of all jobs could potentially be endangered. So the first message is, a huge number of jobs could be lost in the near future. Many of them are jobs with low qualifications and unskilled work, but not all. It could also mean technically skilled personnel also gradually losing their jobs to automation. In total, around 18 million jobs in Germany are potentially at risk from automation and digitalization. We've experienced repeated technical advances, but they generally didn't cost as many jobs. The survey shows that we're now also looking at computers to take over number crunching and replace highly qualified workers. That's a pretty bleak outlook and a warning that Industry 4.0 will not only bring benefits. The securities brokers in the trading area of Commerzbank could likewise face the prospect of being replaced by automated processes, once algorithms are able to make autonomous decisions on the buying and selling of financial products. A lot of companies today are too slow to implement Industry 4.0. The big corporations are doing a relatively good job, but smaller firms are struggling, waiting for someone to come and help them. Personally, I find that approach all wrong. Companies are architects of their own fortunes, and that requires them to take action. The management consultant is paying a visit to a company that has already undergone realignment. In general, sooner or later, manufacturers will have no option but Industry 4.0. I assume there is still a degree of timidity at the moment. A lot of firms have yet to settle on the area they can concentrate on. Even prior to Industry 4.0, work that could be automated has been automated. So more and more manual production processes will become redundant. The trend is being accelerated by Industry 4.0.
It's an area we're very active in. Eventually, we will connect our products directly to the energy exchange, where electricity prices are set, so that we can plan peak and off-peak capacity times, depending on the price of electricity. That will give Weidmüller the maximum benefit and maximum advantage. In the future, machines would decide themselves when to increase production. For example, when the price of electricity is less expensive. Weidmüller specializes in industrial connectivity, electronic systems that coordinate the use of robots in automated production facilities. My vision is for our production sites to be interlinked in a global network and with our customers and our suppliers. Ideally, we would have an autonomous, smart and self-regulating system. So when a customer places an order up at the front, the machine will move itself around the entire delivery chain and at the end the customer gets their individualized product. Magazzino, a new startup in Munich, develops self-controlled systems. The company is working on the world's first independent-minded and operating warehouse. It has received funding from corporations that are hoping to profit from advancements in the future. Siemens is interested in robots that can solve complex tasks in hazardous environments. One example might be robots that could retrieve objects off the shelves in a warehouse. The question is whether it can reach over the book and then pick out another book. You might also want it to do the same thing with boxes. We build robots that can react like humans. The robot moves from shelf to shelf, it can see for itself what objects are there. And then it selects them. That is the robot of the future. Until now, robots in car production, for example, have performed the same weld at the same spot over and over again. They did it quickly and with perfect precision. But if the car was suddenly the other way around, the robots would be stymied. Now, let's take teddy bears, for example. They always look a bit different, or they may have fallen on their back. There's no barcode, no RFID tag. The nice thing is, when you teach robots how to pick out the correct teddy bear, they can then share that information with other robots. The robot also has to be able to work with humans in the same environment, not doing the same task at the same time, but be able to share the same room with humans. Things will continue to advance. We're doing what is currently possible, but we don't yet know what will be possible tomorrow. Look at how much we can detect with cameras. We started with books, now we're picking up teddy bears and reaching into shoe boxes. There's going to be a whole range of advances. Better efficiency, better picker arms, better computer vision algorithms, image recognition. The possibilities are endless. The potential of digitalization for goods distribution and transportation can already be seen at the port of Hamburg. Using the options available with data processing means that we can now automatically manage transportation processes that used to be done manually. We have introduced automation to a degree not previously seen in container handling. For example, we now have automatic vehicles transporting cargo from the container crane to the warehouse. 
Those vehicles can shift containers up to 30 tons in weight and they are able to operate in all conditions, snow, rain, storms and fog. I believe that 20 years from now we will still have containers, but handling them will be more effective. Phase two of automation. The shipping sector will become more like it is with commercial airlines now. Customers perform all manner of tasks themselves, such as checking in, seat assignment and attaching the cargo label to their luggage. We'll be seeing this second stage in the transportation sector as well. The Altenwerde container terminal is among the most technologically advanced in the world. In future, containers at other ports will also find their destinations on their own. I am following Industry 4.0, or rather Labour 4.0, very closely, because we can't achieve anything without the companies and people affected. I don't have a plan, and I don't know exactly how things will go from here. So we initiated an intensive dialogue, raising questions before assuming the answers. At the same time, companies also bear responsibility. So I expect it's going to be a rocky road. We need to find a way of consolidating these new forms of labor that benefits not only company profits, but also employees. Employees is no longer the right term for staff at Crowd Guru. As the first part of the name suggests, they are deployed en masse and are themselves called crowd workers. The business model involves earning money by selling information and data from the internet, data researched by tens of thousands of individuals and then supplied to crowd guru. We have circa 35,000 so-called gurus, as we call them. We have around 35,000 gurus, as we call them. They take care of minor tasks via our platform and work wherever and whenever and how much they want. They can choose which jobs they want to work on. These workers would otherwise have a hard time surviving on the traditional labor market. Their tasks here range from gathering addresses and corporate data to writing product descriptions and price comparisons. There are several hundred thousand crowd workers in Germany alone. Social security insurance or a minimum wage do not apply. We try to work out their hourly rate. If they were to do a certain job for one whole hour, you get a wage of nine or 12 euros or more. Our biggest competition is technological evolution. There are some things we still do with the crowd, things where you still need people to make decisions. With image recognition, for example, our people can categorize and tag particular pictures. Technology is our biggest competition. As it evolves, eventually there'll be an algorithm that can manage these tasks on its own. Industry 4.0 has various names from country to country. In France, it's known as l'industrie du futur, industry of the future. It poses a philosophical question. Is humankind in the process of creating something that will outlive us or something that we can live with in relative harmony? Paul Jorion, anthropologist and economist, has been following the digitalization of industry for decades. When I was researching artificial intelligence in the late 1980s and early 90s, there were still a lot of obstacles, factors that appeared irresolvable. Today, those limits have all but disappeared. They say it's going to be a very long time before we 
see machines replacing humans, a stage called singularity. But in fact, there are advances being made on a daily basis as we move in that direction. Machines will soon be better than us. That might not be the case in all areas today, but with things moving forward very quickly, perhaps it will be tomorrow. The U.S. West Coast has become a hive for young entrepreneurs. Many of them are originally from Europe, and they all want to change the world with computer programs. When my friends and family asked me how I was doing after I got here, my initial response was, I feel at home. Es fühlt sich so an, als ob ich zu Hause angekommen bin. It was mainly because of the sheer number of like-minded people here, all of them with one goal, to change the world and set up successful enterprises. People come here from all over, and the spirit they all share gave rise to Compass. Compass is a software product. Compass is a software product that replaces in-house analysts. Think of the software as an automated corporate doctor, whose job it is to analyze the entire data of the company, and then compile a report on the company's standing, its strengths and weaknesses. That helps the company when it comes to making important decisions, where to invest, time and money. We are at the beginning of a major socio-economic structural change, and companies like ours are now part of that change. But it will lead to a lot of people losing their jobs or having to get retrained in order to find other work. So people who assume that because they've been to college and have a good education will have a secure job may see those hopes dashed. So, in other words, this development, this change, will bring good things, but also bad things. One of the most successful investors involved in Silicon Valley lives in the rolling hills of California's wine country. We tend to talk about Industrial Revolution 4.0, and the simple thing people say is, well, robots are going to replace factory workers' jobs. And I think, to the most part, that's true. But the biggest issue is going to be computers have now gotten to the point where they're so intelligent that they will be able to do a series of jobs, what we call white collar work today. What's required is a totally different education set. That's why I have a little bit of challenge with, quote, industrial revolution. It's really an economic revolution 4.0. Joe Scherndorf is on the board of the World Economic Forum in Davos. The revolution, he says, will not just render millions of jobs redundant, but also a lot of multinational corporations. We're going to see global companies go away. If you look at the Dow in 1890-whatever, when it was started, there were not 30, I think there were only 18. There's only one left today, which is General Electric. All of them went away. I think that if we just look out 10 years from now, about a third of the largest companies in the world today will no longer be around. There was a famous headline that Jamie Dimon uh, said, uh, banking industry, watch out, Silicon Valley is coming to eat your lunch. And uh, I think you could take that and put almost any industry in there. And one that I think you should be particularly concerned about is the automotive industry. I will tell you that that's probably going to have as much disruption 
over the next decade as any other single industry. Uh, as you look at, you know, people make a joke about Tesla today. Don't make a joke about it. Uh, what this team of engineers is doing is pretty important. Here at the most modern car factory in the world, the fourth industrial revolution is in the hands of shiny red robot arms. Some of them are called Thunderbird or Colossus, names that evoke fantasy world superheroes. Car maker Tesla was initially ignored by the big car makers and then belittled. The giants of the industry struggled on with their outdated business models, in certain high profile cases resorting to the manipulation of emissions tests. Meanwhile, the fully automated Tesla production facilities in Silicon Valley were busy building the electric car of the future. But is Silicon Valley with its new concepts of value creation also a paradise for people who work there? In San Francisco, you see these gigantic Google buses pulling up at 7.30 a.m. You'll have 15 or 20 people waiting at public bus stops and being picked up by the corporate buses. And nobody's talking. They're already working. And later they are driven back. You see a lot of downcast faces and very few happy ones. Silicon Valley is the incubator of talent for the digitalized economy. It could be a better place, says Tim Leberecht, if there were more active encouragement of skills specific to humans that machines do not have. The German marketing manager is a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Values and moved to San Francisco in 2003. There's a strong tendency in the valley and in industry in general to have everything quantified and manageable. This regime of constant productivity optimization has now reached extreme levels. What you see in Silicon Valley is a kind of troubleshooting machine. The idea is that any problem, whether social, political or human, can be solved if you deploy technology with maximum effectiveness. Automation and the fourth industrial revolution will make creativity, intuition, compassion and the emotional far more important. If we're competing with automated machines, artificial intelligence, robotics and so on, where performance is judged solely on efficiency and increasing productivity, then we as humans don't really stand a chance. We will be outperformed and, as various studies have forecast, eventually become superfluous. But if we can create scope within companies for creativity, intuition and our individuality, that would mean a loss of control for the companies. So I think in addition to creating human cultures that suit us better and give us more room for expression, ultimately it would also make us more successful. Google has a full-time employee interpreting the insights, traditions and rights of the major religions for it. They think about what Google can learn from Islam, Christianity and Judaism. So they're basically a theological authority. We're living in a phase where everything is being instrumentalized by the power of industry. It's a painful transformational process. But personally, I hope the end result will be a higher status for the humanities and for art.
Nobody expects me. I choose a spot for me and my piano. At first people are bemused, but eventually some people relax and get into the swing of things. I've been all over Germany and Europe with the piano. I'm going to play a nice soft track off the CD. It's called First Sunlight. When I play for people, I notice it has an impact. For them, it's a bit of stress relief. I think that's the biggest effect I can have with my music. It's a pleasant experience for people, and for me too, to see that maybe I can make a bit of a difference. It's work. That's a lot of fun. It totally fulfills me, makes me extremely happy. They call themselves digital nomads. They've said farewell to the concept of a conventional working day. Okay, Leute, herzlich willkommen bitte aus Berlin und herzlich willkommen zur DNX. A digital nomad is a modern migrant laborer who uses telecommunications technologies to earn a living. Although, in contrast to other migrant laborers, we generally decide where we go and we have our own projects. Essentially, you take your work with you on your travels. We notice ourselves how we no longer feel so compliant with what's happening here in Germany, where everything is determined by work. We want to be doing what makes us happy. This year was truly the first year we were on the road more than we were here. The current generation value their freedom very highly and no longer pursue status-related things like a job title, a nice car, and a permanent residence. What matters are the flexibility and self-fulfillment that have only become possible with the Internet. Now you can earn money bringing your own ideas to the street without significant fixed costs. That will become a problem for companies, because the good people will have chosen alternative options. Once you have a distributor, then it's time for the product sample. I earn my money selling on Amazon, kitchen utensils, pet products. So, dog leashes, kitchen tongs, spatulas and the like. I run what you could call a digital general store. Instead of going to the office Monday to Friday, I can just open up my notebook where and when I choose to. And that for me is work. But at the same time, freedom as well. When I was 15, a career advisor came to our class. He told us how important it was to get good grades and have a linear career development. We were to be consistent in our decisions, with no gaps in our resume. All with the goal of becoming employable. For some reason I decided back then that that wasn't for me. It's Startup Diaries. We're Fab and Dom. We escaped our office, packed up our business, and hopped into a Land Rover with our friend Vin. Our mission, travel through South America and meet people who use technology to redefine work. What started as a crazy idea, leaving our office behind, running a business from the road and meeting people who were just as crazy as us, suddenly became a reality. For the next six months we're going to cross South America in La Oficina, the Land Rover Defender, which was to be our office, hostel and means of transportation. I earn my money from having a company. I'm the founder and CEO, as it were. We help other companies to improve their customer service. I spent eight months traveling 20,000 kilometers across South America with my co-worker and another friend. We managed our entire firm from gas stations, hostels and cafes. I'm doing this data migration for an online casino in Las Vegas. And it's just a fun feeling to do it. 
in this environment. So this is really digital nomadism at its best. I got it. I got it. Being a digital nomad, one of the first things to do when arriving at a new place is to get an internet connection. We found Wi-Fi all around in Buenos Aires, though it's a nice feeling to know you have a connection wherever you are. Yes. Movistar, we got an e-connection that's uh, like really super slow edge internet, but we have three dots for the phone connection. This is a scoping call for data migration. And loudspeaker on. The internet gives us everything we need. Whether I'm in the desert in Peru or here in the office in Berlin, it doesn't really matter. If I'm in a slum in Namibia or living on Wall Street, it's irrelevant. Theoretically, I can get the same education as someone who goes to Harvard without having to pay $250,000 for it. Most Ivy League universities post their lectures online for free. Talk to you soon. Have a good day. Bye. This actually worked. <laughs> Somebody has to show people who aren't aware of this, especially young people, that this kind of thing is possible and that the advice they get from career counselors needs an update.